Know what most men in the 60s and 70s don't do. Decide to rob a bank. And yet, in 2015, eight elderly men almost pulled off the biggest jewelry heist in British history, known as the Hatton Garden, safe deposit box robbery. This was no small job, and required both heavy lifting and extreme cleverness, yet these old men very nearly got away with it. Some of the facts about the Great Hatton Garden heist, are enough to leave you speechless. Not only is this one of the few elderly British jewel heist examples in history, but it's also the one with the biggest score. The deposit they were breaking into was heavily guarded for a reason, and these men managed to smuggle out millions and millions of dollars in jewels and cash. You might think of old men robbing jewels as just plain silly, but they cleaned out 73 boxes before escaping. Whether you see these old men as the protagonists in the story, or as the antagonists, it's hard to deny the whole thing seems like something from fiction. But that just makes the Hatton Garden jewelry robbery all the more intriguing. One of the things that makes this heist so unusual and infamous, is the ages of the people who carried it out. Of the eight men involved, all but one of the men were over the age of 50, and the majority were over 60. Terry Perkins was 67, John Kenny Collins was 75, Daniel Jones was 61, William Billy the Fish Lincoln was 60, Carl Wood was 59, and Hugh Doyle was 49, and Governor Brian Reader was 76. There was another thief, only known as Basil at the time, who evaded the police for three years. Reader, the oldest and the original mastermind behind the scheme, was enjoying his retirement at the time of the heist. Although most of the men had a rather shady past, people who knew them described them as harmless, friendly, and kind, not at all the sort of people you'd expect to rob a jewelry deposit. This facade of mild old age actually played a major part in how they were able to manage the job. So how many valuables were in the score? Well, it was the biggest jewel heist in England's history. Some reports estimate about £40 million in jewels was lifted, others say about £7 million in valuables was taken. Plus there was a whole mess of cash that was taken as well. In the end, the crew cracked open all the safety deposit boxes they could out of the roughly thousand inside the vault. It came to 73 boxes before they had to run, and this was enough to total £200 million worth of valuables, gems, and cash, according to some sources. While the whole event sounds pretty cool, the fact is it had real, lasting damage on the bank, as well as the people who had things stored there. This wasn't just cash they were stealing, but actual real valuables, including a few objects that are utterly irreplaceable, and historically relevant. Many of the deposit boxes contained diamonds and gems from jewel traders in the area, all of whom took major losses to their businesses. One man was an orthodox Jewish diamond dealer, whose family had escaped Nazi Germany. They'd sewn diamonds into their clothing to preserve some of their family's valuables, and the diamonds were then stored in Hatton Garden. Those same diamonds were stolen, and never recovered. Another box belonged to an Indian family, who was saving gold jewelry for a dowry for their daughter. Without the jewelry, they feared for the child's future. In other words, this heist hurt a lot of people, not just the bank. There were no signs of breaking at the bank, and the front door had not been breached by force. So, how did they manage to get inside? The police said it did not look like an inside job, so they had to have tricked their way into the building. And that is precisely what happened. No one ever looks twice at an aging maintenance man or janitor. They seem harmless, and given the age of these men, they probably didn't seem capable of doing something so criminal. It was because of this, as well as clever planning, the men were able to just walk into the building, disguised as municipal workers. They wore reflective yellow vests that said gas on the back, hard hats, and white surgical masks to keep their identities hidden. Basil simply stayed in the building after people had gone home, and then let the rest of the men in, through the fire escape. This robbery was not a simple smash and grab, and the kind of physical activity needed to pull it off was hardly easy for men of their age. When they first got into the building, they called the elevator and then disabled it on the second floor. They then pried open the elevator doors, and rappelled down the elevator shaft about 14 feet to the basement. From there, they opened the steel shutter covering the door leading to the vault, and disabled the alarm by cutting the telephone wires. The alarm did send an alert to the monitoring company, but not in time to stop them from getting away with the jewels. 
After they drilled holes in the back of the safe, three circular holes overlapping side by side, they had to crawl through the tight opening, of only 10 by 18 inches. Then, the man inside had to smash open the deposit boxes and pass all the jewels through, to their partners. As Rita saw it, if you wanted to steal diamonds, you wanted the diamond of drills to do it. He'd had experience with robbery before in his younger years, though nothing of this magnitude, and he decided to research what sorts of drills he could buy online. He finally settled on the Hilti DD350 diamond coring drill to go through the back of the vault, to get at the jewels inside. Unfortunately, the eventual attempt was fraught with issues, and one of them turned out to be the drill. When they initially tried to drill through on April 4, 2015, their placement was a bit off, and they instead drilled into the rear of the cabinet made of steel they couldn't get through. They prepared to use the drill again, but the pump jammed, rendering the drill completely useless. Eventually, they decided they had to give up and try again the next day with a better functioning drill. If you've seen the original Ocean's Eleven, you might recall the would-be thieves used garbage bins, to try to transport their loot. It didn't work out so well for them, but it worked out splendidly for the Grandpa Gang. When the Grandpa Gang first arrived on the scene, they got out of a white rented van, unloaded bags, tools, and of course, garbage bins. They brought them to the fire escape and left them there. Surveillance footage then showed them eventually coming back out, and loading tools and equipment into the van. They wheeled the garbage bins to the van, and it was obvious they were much heavier. No one batted an eye as they loaded up, because they were dressed as maintenance men, so it was easy for them to work without attracting too much attention. From there, they sped away into the night with their loot. While the grandpa gang finally was eventually caught, they got to save a sweet, wealthy freedom, for more than a month. The Hatton Garden investigative teams began looking into the crimes right away, and it didn't take them long to get leads, but because the gang had done such an in-depth planning job, it took quite a while to put all the pieces together. They had to trace the car, examine all the surveillance photos, set up cameras and microphones to record conversations, then wait for the men to talk about the crime, so they'd have evidence for an arrest. When planning a major heist, it stands to reason you would take time to prepare, the Grandpa Gang, as they're sometimes known, were extremely patient. They waited and planned for three years, until they were sure everything was perfect. In 2012, Daniel Jones, one of the ringleaders, first brought up the idea to a few others. It began as a simple musing by a retired man, but he couldn't get the thought out of his head. When he found that others had an interest in the plan as well, he started the initial reconnaissance. And it took a whole lot of reconnaissance. The men would go in to observe the Hatton Garden hours, how workers moved and began to research the vault itself. Before long, Jones was beginning to research and buy equipment online, and they had a plan to complete the job a few years down the line. There are some advantages to being a senior citizen, and one of them is transportation options. As the oldest member of the group, Reader was easily old enough to have a senior citizen bus pass, which he used regularly. While others in the group were discussing rental cars to get to and from the scene, Rita was busy checking bus routes, trying to take full advantage of that senior discount. On the night of the first robbery attempt on April 2, 2015, everyone else transported themselves in groups, but not Rita. Instead, he waited at the number 96 bus stop near his home in Kent. He then swiped his senior pass, boarded the bus, and took it to Hatton Garden, an 80-minute journey. Lucky for him the bus ride was free, because of his age. Forget all those youngsters renting cars for dual heists, public transportation is the way to go. While these men were professionals, they weren't above getting help. Self-help, that is. After police finally caught some of the men involved, they raided their houses searching for jewels, cash, and evidence of the heist. They found one particular piece of evidence, that was particularly damning. A self-help book titled Forensics for Dummies, that the gang used to research police investigation techniques, and how to avoid getting caught. And it probably was a pretty good investment. Police found no fingerprints, hair, or any forensic evidence at the scene. In Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs, all of the would-be thieves are referred to by color-coded nicknames, like Mr. Pink and Mr. White. The Grandpa Gang had a very similar situation. 
Instead of colors, the thieves were called by various nicknames a la Tarantino style, the Gov, the Gent, Mr. Ginger, Mr. Basil, Mr. Strong, Mr. Montana, the Tall Man, and the Old Man. These names came to be, after CCTV footage of the robbery went public. A British newspaper started using these terms, and their popularity caught on. When planning the biggest jewel heist in English history, you want to sit someplace secret and private. The Grandpa Gang didn't exactly see it that way. Instead, they preferred to do the planning and discussion sessions at a local pub. The castle in Islington was where they decided to set up shop. There, they went over the details of the upcoming raid, even days before it happened. They also returned there afterward to discuss how to split up the loot and what they would do with it. The pub is still open, and the staff has been told not to talk about the Hatton Garden heist. That being said, some come there out of fascination, so the business is still booming. While these men may have appeared to be the unassuming sort, most of them had a rather shady past. Terry Perkins in particular, had a long history of jail time and violence. He spent years in Spring Hill Prison and had been on the run for 17 years until 2012 when he finally was arrested. He had robbed a bank before and during that time, he doused an employee in gasoline, then threatened him with a box of matches. Hardly your cuddly old grandpa. All the others had skills too. They were either good muscle, smart bookkeepers, mechanics or organizers, and each man brought his expertise to the crime. Two of the men, Perkins and Danny Jones, had attempted a very similar robbery only five years before. They'd made off with around £1 million in a smash and grab of jewels and cash, using maintenance disguises and a drill to get in. Let's say you've robbed a bank, and you've got a lot of cash and jewels burning a hole in your pocket. Where do you stash the goods until it's safe to become a big spender? This was the dilemma the Hatton Garden heist members faced once the deed was finally done. Each man had their ideas about what to do with their share. Police found gems at the homes of several of the men, and other valuables were found, ironically, in deposit boxes. Kenny Collins, their logistics man, even hid his loot in casserole dishes. One man's ingenuity stands above the rest, though. Danny Jones took a portion of his jewels and money and went to a graveyard where his family was buried. Then, he put his share beneath the graves, where they remained stored until police recovered them. Grim, but at least it was more creative than, casserole dishes. On April 2nd the first attempt to breach the safety deposit area, they rented vans and cars to get to the scene, their oldest member and leader took the bus, and they were careful to hide the faces and characteristics from security footage. They even used walkie-talkies to avoid phone records. During their second try on April 8th however, they made one of the most basic mistakes you can make during a heist. Picking a bad getaway car. Before the crime, Kenny Collins had driven his car, registered under his name, past Hatton Garden many times, for scouting work. As it turns out, he drove past one too many times for investigative teams to ignore. He also took the car to the scene on the night of the successful robbery. The license plate was clearly visible, and because the car had long belonged to Collins, it was easy to trace back. The car showed up on previous footage too, and it only took a few days for investigators to decide this was the best lead. A month later, most of the other thieves were brought in. Despite being caught, the grandpa gang didn't exactly rush to turn each other in, and one of the men remained an enigma to police and investigators. He was only known as Basil. On surveillance footage, we can see he had light, reddish hair, is tall, and looked a bit younger than many of the other men. But other than that, police had few leads. There was even an offer of a £20,000 reward, though. There were a lot of theories as to where he was hiding. He might be in Russia, maybe being hunted by mafia or hitmen. He could be in Panama, or still somewhere in London. He was actually apprehended in March 2019, in his own apartment. His name is Michael Seed, he is 58, from Islington. Seed, an alarm specialist who denied the charges, was also found guilty of conspiring to hide the proceeds. Seed is believed to have let himself into the building, in London's Diamond District using a set of keys. He was one of two men who climbed into the vault to loot 73 safe deposit boxes after the gang of aging criminals drilled through the thick concrete wall during the 2015 Easter bank holiday weekend. 
Seed, who pays no taxes, claims no benefits and rarely uses a bank account, evaded capture for three years. Police raided his flat, in Islington, North London, located about two miles away from Hatton Garden, on 27 March last year. The electronics expert told a jury at Woolwich Crown Court he was not the man nicknamed Basil by the rest of the gang. But jurors returned a unanimous guilty verdict for the second charge of conspiracy to handle the proceeds after £143,000 worth of gold ingots, gems and jewellery were found in his bedroom. Seed is believed to have been melting down gold and breaking up jewellery on his bedroom workbench. He was jailed for 10 years for the burglary and 8 years for the second charge, with the terms to run concurrently. Kenny Collins, Daniel Jones, and Terry Perkins were found guilty of conspiracy to commit burglary and given a seven-year sentence. Carl Wood and William Lincoln were found guilty of conspiracy to conceal, convert, or transfer criminal property and were given six and seven years in prison respectively. Hugh Doyle was sentenced to 21 months for the same charge. Ringleader Brian Reader was sentenced to six years in prison, and an eighth man named John Harbinson was found not guilty. Reader later suffered a stroke. Given the popularity of heist movies, and how fantastical this whole tale seems, it makes perfect sense that Hollywood would want to get their hooks into the Hatton Garden heist. One movie that came out in 2017, titled The Hatton Garden Job, received very poor reviews, leaving many people thinking that there's still a chance to make this into a successful movie. Even the Morgan Freeman movie Going in Style has many similarities to this infamous heist. It's hard to deny that, whether you see them as villains, heroes, or just strange, the Grandpa Gang captured the attention of the world.